Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ashley DePriest. I am the president for the Southeast Chapter Society of Critical Care Medicine. Thank you all for joining us today for this lunchtime lecture, um, our Bite Sides Lecture Series. I'm very excited today to introduce you guys to our four um, speakers. First up, we will have, um, our, excuse me, our speakers will be speaking today on necrotizing enterocolitis in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and first up, we'll have Dr. Brenda Marino, who is the medical director for the neonatal intensive care unit here at Wellstar Kennestone Hospital and has been a part of this team since its inception in 1982. She attended medical school in Downstate Medical School in Brooklyn, New York, and completed her pediatrics residency at St. Luke Hospital in New York and fellowship at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. After Dr. Marino speaks, we'll be followed up by Sarah Wallace. She's a senior dietitian in the neonatal intensive care unit here at Kennesone. She graduated from the University of Georgia and has a master's in nutrition from the University of Alabama. She's been a dietitian for six years and enjoys most about her job when she gets to see her patients at their yearly NICU reunion. Next up will be Elizabeth McCormick, PharmD. She is a pediatric clinical pharmacist at Wellstar Kennesone. She graduated from the University of Georgia and completed a PGY-1 and PGY-2 residency. She is a board certified pediatric pharmacist and has been a part of the Kennestone team since 2015. And finally, we will have Robin Gaffney, who is a professional nurse educator for the NICU at Wellstar Kennestone Hospital. She's a registered nurse holding a BSN from Kaplan University, having graduated summa cum laude honors, Robin has worked in the NICU specialty for 20 years and holds a certification in high-risk neonatal intensive care. Robin is also a lead and support instructor for programs associated with AWHONN, STABLE, and AHA programs such as BLS and neonatal resuscitation, and she's also PIC certified. In addition to being a guest presenter at national and local AWHONN conventions, Robin is the recipient of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution Nursing Excellence Award and the Wellstar Pediatric Game Changer and Shining Star Awards, as well as the Daisy Award for Nursing. I'm very excited to get this uh, talk started. Just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, we'll go through each uh, set of speakers and then we'll save questions for the end. So please um, make sure you check over into the chat box and we'll look for questions there at the very end. So without further ado, we'll get started with Dr. Brenda Marino. Thank you. Okay, today we're going to be speaking about a life-threatening illness known as necrotizing enterocolitis, which is deadly to about 7% There we are. There we go. So let's, yeah, let's go ahead and start right back from the beginning. Okay. We'll be good. Yep. Okay. Today we're talking about necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a life threatening illness of preterm infants. It affects about 7% of preterm infants and term babies that have. Uh, underlying conditions such as congenital heart disease or any kind of condition that can cause bowel ischemia, including hypoxia at birth. 
It was first diagnosed in the 70s as an unusual condition. Preterm infants would be going along pretty well and suddenly would have bowel findings and perforation and, and then death. Uh, it is actually an autodigestion of the bowel where the organisms inside the bowel that uh, the light, the uh, protective lining of the bowel is somehow compromised and the organisms then eat through the bowel wall. In horses, this is actually known as colic. And the reason I bring this up is I was at a meeting about necrotizing enterocolitis a few years ago and I uh, found that part of the um, participants in the meeting were veterinarians. So I thought that was an interesting happening. Only they, of course, treat it with a lot more larger quantities of um, antibiotics and mineral oil. In any case, the risk factors are perinatal and postnatal stress, hypothermia, congenital heart disease, sepsis, possibly rapid feeding advances, and possibly recent transfusions. The clinical findings of necrotizing enterocolitis can be very subtle. They can also progress very quickly. Initially, there is temperature instability, apnea, can be lethargy, hypotension, hyperglycemia, and eventually abdominal distension with discoloration of the bowel, bloody bowel movements, increased gastric residual, and emesis basically an ileus pattern. The diagnosis is made by x-ray, but there are th three different stages in the diagnosis, including a suspected stage associated with gastric retention, uh, abdominal distension, an ileus, and finally a uh, pneumatosis for one stage, which is air within the bowel wall. And pneumatosis is actually caused by bacteria that ferment carbohydrate and produce hydrogen gas in the bowel wall. And pneumatosis is often seen as a bubbly pattern on x-ray. And the last stage, of course, is perforation uh, that can be associated with grossly bloody stools in emesis. The management of necrotizing enterocolitis is um, basically antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics. There are so many organisms that are involved. It's not one particular organism, so we have to do broad spectrum, seven to 10 days or longer. Sometimes antifungals are used because the child could be clinically worse and you kind of add everything into the armamentarium. Fluid resuscitation to have help to perfuse the bowel wall, blood transfusions as necessary. Serial x-rays are done to look for uh, perforation if it occurs. 50% of these children will require surgery, and that is indicated if the bowel wall is edematous, portal venous gas, fixed bowel loops on x-ray, and perforation. In some children under 1,500 grams, and particularly the very tiny ones, peritoneal drains are used that can be curative without surgery. However, up to 75% of those children may go on to need surgery. The complications of necrotizing enterocolitis are basically 35% surgical mortality but the medical cases have less of a mortality and also less of developmental delays. So 20% have a of the medical cases have a mortality. Strictures can occur after medical management in about 20% of the cases. Even if no surgery is done, there could be scarring of the bowel that can cause an obstruction. And this may occur as a child is growing and in a more stable condition. Short gut syndrome can occur after surgery for um, the acute cases, and this may require total parenteral nutrition for one to two years, as well as tube feedings. Cognitive delays occur more often in children who have required surgery as opposed to medical treatment, 
And also growth failure is responsible for these cognitive delays and motor delays. The prevention can be hopefully uh, surmised by using just breast milk only for preterm infants. That has been found to be the most effective at this point. There's probiotics also that are being used and there are protocols for that as well as feeding protocols. And this is gonna be discussed with the other speakers. Thank you very much and we'll be looking forward to your questions. Okay, so my name is Sarah Wallace, like Ashley said earlier, um, and I'm going to be kind of presenting a little bit about breast milk as a preventative measure um, for necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, so a little background on the premature gut. It is the connection to the outside world, which is kind of, you know, it's true for adults as well. But um, the big thing is the gut is actually matured in the third trimester when women are pregnant, and that's when that maturation occurs. So these little kiddos have immature mucosal barrier function, immature immune response, incomplete innervation, all which makes like a nice, horrible storm for necrotizing enterocolitis. And then they also have poor motility. Um, now, one of the things about poor motility, we try to do trophic feedings, which can help with motility, um, and that's kind of one of our preventative measure, measures along with breast milk. Another thing is these kids have low secretary IgA, which leads to inflammation, um, and so inflammation also puts them at risk for necrotizing in our colitis. Um, another interesting thing is that these kids, um, their uh, microbiome starts to develop in utero, uh, which is kind of a newer found um, information instead of what we used to think was that the microbiome started at birth. And then there was a whole slew of research looking at vaginal birth microbiome versus C-sections, which is just a whole other area of research, which is really interesting. Um, in the NICU, we really depend a lot on um, trophic feedings um, and we use breast milk to do this. Um, and when our, with our trophic feedings, it's about 20 milliliters per kilogram. And this stimulates the GI mucosa and also helps with the motility I talked about a second ago. Um, and what is great is there is no um, shown correlation with an increase of neck with trophic feedings, which was previously thought that if you fed a child, you know, they were going to get neck. And so a lot of our kids stayed on TPN for an extremely long time until we felt pretty secure. Okay, so breast milk is the standard. Uh, a big thing that when I say breast milk is the standard of care, I'm mainly talking about maternal breast milk. Um, breast milk in general is an optimal source of nutrition. Um, it's got a low osmolarity, which makes it ideal for these super premature guts that are just very sensitive because they're premature and they just kind of need to grow up and develop a little bit better. Um, and it's recommended that anybody below 1500 grams receives breast milk. Um, we have donor breast milk available. Um, a lot of facilities are getting breast milk, donor breast milk because we know that breast milk is so much better in preventing necrotizing enterocolitis, which is so devastating. Um, and then we also know that maternal breast milk is really good as well. Um, we don't recommend milk sharing. That's actually going around a lot and a lot of women are milk sharing, um, but the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends strongly against it just because you don't know what other people are using. Um, and when donor breast milk is actually made, people do it by pooling um, other donor moms together. So if there was something that didn't get killed through the pasteurization, it's very low 
if it was in you know, the batch at all. Um, so just kind of putting that out there that we strongly recommend against milk sharing. Um, but it is very well proven that using breast milk in general, whether it's donor or maternal, decreases neck rates. It's actually a three-fold to ten-fold reduction in neck with infants fed breast milk versus formula, which makes it a medical necessity to have breast milk. And it's very important to us here at Kinestone that we have breast milk available for our moms. And then the other caveat to using breast milk with these premature children is that we have to have fortification, meaning that we have to increase either the maternal breast milk or the donor breast milk um, with a fortifier that contains carbs, protein, fat, um, to get these children to grow. Um, and there's two um, possibilities for fortification in the market. There's a human milk fortifier um, that's made of bovine, and there's one made completely of human milk. And those are available. And here at Kinestown, we use um, both kinds with our extremely low birth weight infants. We use a completely human milk fortifier of all human milk because we really feel like the research for the low osmolarity and um, prevention of neck for those very low um, birth weight infants that have very immature guts, it's worth the um, money to put into having an exclusive breast milk diet. So donor breast milk, and I don't say any of this about donor breast milk for people to not think that it's a good source of nutrition because it is, um, and we're very fortunate at our facility to have it, but it's not ideal as, composed to, as opposed to mother's breast milk because donor breast milk is pasteurized, like I said before, and it's also batched. And a lot of times when you're getting donor breast milk, you're getting it for a term mama at the end of her time and once breast milk goes from the early days well once moms go from the early days of having their children to later on your breast milk actually becomes a little different in composition it's going to have a little bit less protein and it's typically a little bit less calorically dense um, as your baby matures your breast milk changes so a lot of times we're getting term breast milk um, from donors that has been batched and pulled together and then through the pasteurization process it kills some of those beautiful nutrients that breast milk's known for and that we're still researching today and I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so what's killed is actually um, like neutrophil cells, um, stem cells, uh, probiotic properties are killed a lot of times during the pasteurization process. Um, macronutrients, specifically fat, can be um, damaged during the pasteurization process. Um, Anti-inflammatory markers can be damaged during the um, pasteurization process. Um, so these are some big things that we actually like for our preemies to get, and we feel like they are very protective, um, especially probiotics, which Elizabeth McCormick, our pharmacist, talks about in a little bit as well. Um, there's also a decreased bioactive components of lactoferrin and immunoglobulins. Um, and like I said before, it's a really big deal that we kind of know that donor breast milk is not the optimal number one choice and that we support moms. Um, with trying to get maternal breast milk for these at-risk infants. So I love the nitty-gritty kind of science parts about breast milk. And so that's kind of what this slide represents, is how does breast milk work um, more than just being something low in osmolarity and, you know, a good source of protein. For these babies. It has cytokines um, and these cytokines have uh, chemical mediators um, and so it also has like a pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effect but we mostly look at it for its anti-inflammatory effect. Um, then we have the growth factor. Um, it acts as a pro protective molecule by possibly protecting and developing the intestines from neck. Um, which is just really important. A lot of people look at, you know, all the research that we see on growth factors. And then you have immune, immunoglobulins, IgAs, which is found in colostrum and maternal breast milk. Um, and a lot of facilities have protocols for providing colostrum into like at least the mouth and do some oral care with these babies so they get colostrum that's full of immunoglobulins. Um, Lactoferrin is a glycoprotein that acts as an antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant property. Um, 
And it's extremely important to know that that's found in maternal breast milk and it's, you know, killed during the pasteurization process. I think it's very interesting that erythropoietin is also found in maternal breast milk, um, and this affects the intestinal maturation and can help, and can help with red blood cell production. Um, the most interesting thing I found with some of my research is that there was pluripotent stem cells found in 2007 in breast milk. Um, I don't know much more about that, but I feel that like that's very interesting. Um, and then prebiotic and probiotic bacteria are both found in breast milk. A big hot topic is human milk oligosaccharides. Um, it's the third largest component found in maternal breast milk, and it helps feed our probiotic bacteria that's um, found in breast milk, um, specifically bifidobacteria, um, which is a really highly studied probiotic that people look at giving preterm infants, which is naturally found in breast milk. Um, uh, the hot topic of human milk oligosaccharides is actually being added into formula these days, and there's a lot of research out there on it. Um, and I think it's really important to look at these properties, you know, and look at breast milk as the standard and see how we can not mimic it, but make sure that babies are provided all these wonderful benefits. Um, and then also my big takeaway is just that, you know, we need to support moms in breastfeeding if they can, because it almost takes a village. And I will say from personal experience, it's hard to breastfeed and it's hard to pump. Um, so those are the big things is that if you can put money into making sure that um, your facility supports babies, it's a big deal. Okay. And that's all I have for that. Good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth McCormick, and I'm going to be talking about medications in next this afternoon. I have nothing to disclose concerning actual or potential conflicts of interest, but I will be discussing off-label uses of medications. It's imperative to initiate treatment rapidly when signs and symptoms suggestive of NEC are present, initially assessing respiratory support and providing supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation if needed, and then assessing circulatory support um, that would be necessary and providing support as needed, either with the bolus of NS or fresh frozen plasma if necessary, or maybe a couple of boluses. And if circulatory status is not improved enough, then adding on a vasopressor. Our first line vasopressor is usually dopamine, and we will um, maximize that dose uh, before we add on a second agent. And usually our second go-to agent is epinephrine. It's critical to obtain appropriate cultures prior to the start of antimicrobial therapy. Standard practice across the board is to obtain blood cultures. And then optional, depending upon how the patient presents and what seems necessary, are cerebral spinal fluid cultures, urine cultures. Peritoneal fluid cultures can be obtained if peritoneal fluid is obtained. And stool cultures have been obtained sometimes in the past, but in general, they've been found to be of very limited value. When evaluating what antibiotics to start, it's imperative to cover for organisms associated with late onset sepsis in a neonate. And these are group B strep, E. coli, staph epidermis and dermatis and staph aureus, enterobacter and H. flu. 
Additional microorganisms that have been associated with NEC are Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Salmonella, and Enterococcus, as well as Clostridium. Uh, in terms of fungal species, Canada species have been associated with NEC, and even viruses have been associated with NEC, including coronavirus and rotavirus. To the best of my knowledge, we do not have any, um, I haven't heard of any reported cases of the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus currently causing the pandemic causing NEC, but it will be interesting over time to see how that evolves. Um, blood cultures, uh, when they are positive, which is only about 10 to 50% of the time do we get positive blood cultures, um, are usually found to have enteric bacteria. So we look to treat with a broad spectrum antibiotics to cover gram positive and gram negative bacteria. There's no evidence from studies that any one antimicrobial regimen is superior to another. So ampicillin and gentamicin and ampicillin and cefotaxime are equally acceptable. Additionally, if we are concerned about a resistant staph aureus or staph epi, vancomycin and gentamicin would be the agents of choice. For medical neck, there hasn't been found to be any added benefit of including anaerobic antimicrobial therapy in the treatment regimen. But if there are concerns for perforation, then metronidazole should be added on to the uh, above regimens. Clindamycin was used more in the past, but um, there, there have been shown to be a trend towards a higher rate of strictures in those receiving clindamycin. So that's led to a reduction in its use. Additionally, instead of the other agents uh, listed above, when there's a concern for perforation, piperacillin, tazobactam, or meropenem can be chosen for treatment with vancomycin added on if there are concerns in addition for resistant gram-positive bacteria. If the patient receives broad-spectrum antibiotics and is clinically worsening, or if gram stain and culture results uh, indicate that uh, fungal elements are seen, then amphotericin B can be started. And uh, the duration of treatment for neck is recommended in most resources to be about 10 to 14 days with uh, narrowing the spectrum of antibiotics when we are able to. I'm gonna move on now from discussing acute neck to discuss the neonatal microbiome a little bit more, which you have heard about already quite a bit from Sarah. Um, at baseline, it's been found that infants have a lower diversity of their intestinal microbiome than adults do, with it reaching something similar to the adult microbiome around the age of three years old. The diversity in preterm infant intestinal microbiome is much more limited than full term, with a majority of the microbiome in preterm infants to be known neonatal pathogens such as Enterobacteraceae. So the concern is that colonization by these pathological bacteria is one of the events that leads to neck. Um, and you can see there that I've highlighted antibiotic exposure um, because all of these factors influence the development of the neo neonatal microbiome, as do many others. I just have a select few here that are included. Um, but the question is, what then happens to the neonatal microbiome with antibiotic exposure? Well, there have been retrospective studies that have looked at IV antibiotic exposure, and it has been associated with contributing to abnormal bacterial colonization of the infant intestinal lumen. What they found is there's a decrease in species diversity and density, and an alteration in the species that are present. There's a delay in the maturation of the intestinal microbiome and the presence of antibiotic resistant genes. And the studies found that this was with a duration of exposure of greater than five days. The top two um, changes that you see there that I have put an asterisk by, the decrease in species diversity and density and the alteration in species present um, have both been found to be associated with NEC. So this raises the question as, as uh, both Dr. Marino and Sarah both already touched on a little bit, is can we alter the microbiome to result in a healthier environment and maybe reduce, reduce the risk of NEC? And for that, we have turned to looking at probiotics. Probiotics are live microorganisms that are intended to have health benefits, and they are dietary supplements. And since they are a dietary supplement, in general, they're considered safe by the FDA until proven unsafe, unlike a drug which is considered unsafe until it's proven safe. 
And that puts up a little bit of a red flag when you're dealing with this very fragile population. They don't go through the rigorous approval process that drugs do. Um, and uh, that's one of the issues that has led to um, them not being taken on quite as rapidly in this population as maybe in some older uh, populations that are more immune sufficient. But we would like to help prevent, we would like to prevent NEC. That would be our first goal. And so the question is, are probiotics the answer or at least one piece of the puzzle that could help with that problem? Uh, suggested mechanisms of action are that they would improve the function of the intestinal barrier by increasing the barrier, barrier to bacterial migration and competitively excluding uh, or inhibiting potential pathogens. They could help regulate the immune response within the intestine and also mod modulate that inflammatory balance within the intestines. There have been multiple studies, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses done, and yet um, we have struggled to con to identify um, optimal strains, doses, and populations to use these medications in, although uh, it is becoming clearer. Much of the problem is because the studies have varied so greatly. There have been differences in enrollment criteria of the patients. The probiotic species preparation studies have varied greatly. Some of the studies have used, used individual strains. Others have used mixtures of strains. There's the thought that maybe a multi-strain probiotic is more beneficial because the two strains will work synergistically. However, if you combine multiple different kinds of probiotics into a meta-analysis, then we have concern that how reliable is the meta-analysis because are we comparing apples to apples? Um, the doses have varied uh, from being using colony forming units, just a flat number, to colony forming units per kilogram. And additionally, um, the frequency um, from once daily all the way up to four times daily has varied uh, for administration. Uh, what product do we use in this in this population has been a big challenge because obviously a neonate can not, not just swallow a capsule. And Really, one of the big uh, issues, I think, with quite a few of the studies is that, as Sarah spoke about, feeding regimens significantly influence the development of neck, and often the studies have not controlled for this. So how specific or st significant this impact is, we don't really know, but there's concern that uh, that could actually be part of the role of where we've seen some of the benefits. However, Many of the studies have found that probiotics were overall safe. Um, however, many of the studies also lack statistical power because they are so small. A few other issues that I just want to mention that have kind of raised eyebrows is that some commercial products have contained different bacterial strains than what was on the ingredient list it has been found during the study. Uh, one was found to be contaminated with a fungus. There's also been found to be cross-colonization to other babies in the environment. Um, in one study, the placebo group was found to be more colonized with the probiotic of study after the study was complete than prior to the study, and um, it was thought that it was probably cross-colonization. The significance of this isn't really known, but um, it, we do want to make sure that we are giving the baby that we want to receive the, the probiotic, the probiotic, and not necessarily others in the area. Additionally, we don't really know how this impacted the results of the study. And there have been a few instances of probiotic-related sepsis. So there, there are um, a few agents on the market now that tailor more to the neonate. We are not using them in our NICU yet. But I think uh, some of these areas that I've discussed are, are becoming more and more defined. Uh, certainly, if anybody out there who's listening um, is using them in their NICU, we would be interested in hearing your experience with them. Um, but un until we come up with something a little bit more concrete, I think we have felt like we would rather wait and err on the side of just excessive safety before we jump into that uh, pool. And now I'm going to turn it over to Robin Gaffney.
Hi everyone. As Ashley said, my name is Robin Gaffney and I'm the professional nurse educator for the NICU at Walster Kennestone Hospital. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I have nothing to disclose concerning actual potential conflicts in relation to the presentation and I will not be discussing off-label uses of medications. So when covering the nursing component as it relates to NEC, it seemed to me to make some sense to divide the components into three categories I'm calling the three A's. Assessment before we start care, assessment done during care, and anticipated actions or interventions. The first A being assessment before starting care. The goal of this process is really being directed towards identifying factors, placing an infant at risk for neck, employing strategies to reduce neck, and identifying the need for heightened surveillance or index of suspicion. Four components to this approach incorporate, incorporates chart reviews, interdisciplinary handoffs, continuity of care, and advocacy. In discussing chart reviews, a detailed review of both mom's and baby's chart can identify events occurring during the antenatal, intrapartum, and postpartum periods that would potentially increase the risk for NAC. A chart review can also offer insight into the presence of conditions that are strongly associated with NAC, but also other conditions not so strongly associated with NAC, but yet would increase the risk, things such as multi-parity, delivery by C-section, maternal hypertension, maternal obesity, anemia, or a maternal exposure to antibiotics throughout the course of the pregnancy. A thorough interdisciplinary handoff when assuming care helps in establishing what an infant's individual baseline has been, making deviations from that baseline more easily identifiable to the bedside caregiver and affords a more timely response. In addition to chart reviews and handoffs, continuity of care and advocacy play a really important role in promoting positive outcomes. Continuity of caregivers offers the advantage of staff being familiar with an individual infant's baseline, promotes early detection of the very subtle changes associated with NEC, and truly a staffing model that supports or can support primary care is really ideal for high-risk infants. Nursing acting as advocates for our babies by promoting the use of accepted preventative strategies can greatly impact an infant's outcome. An example of something a bedside nurse would advocate for would be the use of any available breast milk for oral care and as Sarah alluded to, gut priming trophic feeds. The second A is for assessment during care. A thorough and detailed assessment is critical in picking up on a very broad spectrum of both subtle nonspecific signs, as well as things that are more suggestive symptoms related to the presentation of neck. A real challenge for the NICU team is always sorting through the nonspecific signs that can be attributed to many other factors other than neck, such as prematurity and all the conditions associated with prematurity. As Dr. Marino indicated, development of neck can be slow progressing or can be a very rapid progression so that a baby can be giving you subtle signs and several hours, four to five hours later, being, being in full-blown necrotizing septic shock. So the goal for the, our nursing assessment during our care is to promote early recognition, early diagnosis, and early intervention. Some things that the bedside caregiver are gonna be looking at um, would start with vital signs. Some examples of vital sign changes that are nonspecific can be things like apnea, bradycardia, mild hypotension, and subtle temperature changes, including changes in an environmental temperature reading of the baby's isolate. 
And again, the trick is that all of these nonspecific signs can also be attributed to a normal course of a premature infant. We also would assess um, the baby's developmental threshold. When we're looking at development of the baby, we're looking at their overall well-being and their interaction with their environment. And some nonspecific changes that might clue us in that we might see at the bedside would be subtle changes in the baby's muscle tone or their posture, a change or a decreased engagement of the infant either with their environment or their caregiver, and we can see some behavioral changes. The baby may become lethargic or conversely, they may become irritable. Moving down to the physical assessment component, um, we, when we focus on the part of the physical assessment, we can glean more neck specific signs, such as the 3Ds of an abdominal assessment. What we would be looking for is the distension of the abdomen or the presence of bowel loops showing through the abdomen area. We look for discoloration, and on our babies, that can be a bluish or red or a gray coloring or hue to the abdomen area. Or we can see a shiny and, or tautness to the skin over the abdomen. And the third D that may present is discomfort. We can also see other GI-related symptoms. Um, so we're looking for changes in bowel sounds, development of feeding intolerance, such as a gastric residual or a change in the pattern of gastric residuals, and or emesis. And we can also see stools with occult or frank blood, although those tend to be a later sign. But we can also be looking for abdominal edema. So in addition to that, we're also going to be looking while we're doing care at our lab results. And we, what we may see change is the lab results may reveal the presence of thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, metabolic acidosis, elevated CRPs, or the presence of hyper or hypoglycemia. To help us with that furthering the assessment of the abdomen, we will be looking at our radiology assessments, again, looking at those x-rays for distended, fixed, dilated bowel loops, pneumatosis intestinalysis, which looks like champagne bubbling on the intestinal wall, or we can be looking for perforation or free air on x-ray. One of the things that we cannot overlook and cannot be emphasized enough is the report of the parent or even the gut feeling of the nurse. We can never overlook an intuitive parent reporting to us that their baby just does not seem the same. Moving on to anticipated actions and interventions. As a nurse caring for the baby, our goal are, of our actions and our interventions are to promote cover, recovery by providing a healing environment, optimize physical function and maintain homeostasis, and reduce the risk of complications by preventing hypoxemia, hypotension, hypovolemia, and hypothermia. In order to accomplish this, these are some things that as a bedside nurse, we would want to anticipate or be prepared for. Starting with making an infant NPO, establishing both venous and arterial access for the administration and provision of parental nutrition, medications, vasopressor support, as well as monitoring hemodynamic status and obtaining lab sampling. When it comes to labs, we are commonly looking at that CBC with differential, drawing blood cultures, electrolytes, and possibly coags and type and crosses for potential future transfusions. We look closely at all newborns, but particularly premature babies or babies who are ill, in maintaining what we call a neutral thermal environment. And that's an environment which the baby is not having to use additional energy or oxygen consumption solely for the purpose of maintaining their own temperature. Oftentimes, this can necessitate us providing additional thermoregulation support through equipment such as a radiant warmer or an isolate for a baby who maybe had been in an open bed. We'll also look at providing appropriate pain management as indicated by pain scale scores. We will enhance their developmental care through something we call minimal stimulation. 
This means that at the bedside, caregivers would actually extend the time interval between episodes where care is rendered and coordinate with other disciplines to cluster our care, allowing for maximizing rest times and minimizing disruptions between episodes of care. It often necessitates establishing gastric decompression, which can simply mean a gastric tube being passed and set up to vent, or it can include passing a replogal tube and setting that up to low intermittent suction, as well as performing serial abdominal girths with each care episode. Because often we are having to reestablish all our lines, drays, and airways, the nurse would be responsible for managing those. And as already alluded to from a respiratory support, it is not um, uncommon for infants to require a higher acuity of support, which may include intubation and subsequent mechanical ventilation. While we always hope to prevent a surgical case, there are babies that need to be moved to the OR. So the nurse would be responsible for all the pre-op care and then also providing the post-surgical management. The post-surgical management, depending on what's done in the OR, can include just basic post-operative supportive care, but could also escalate into providing care to an ostomy. And in some more severe cases, managing palliative care if it is an unrecoverable situation. Again, last but not least, we always need to consider the parents, providing them with as much education and support and maintaining a family-centered environment whenever possible. Having a baby in the NICU is just overall and in general a devastating time for parents. Then having to add on the additional need to manage through a complication such as NAC, we always need to be assessing that family for their coping skills and providing them any support and resources that are needed. So that is a general overview of kind of the nursing care involved in taking care of a baby with neck. The following two slides are the references. And we're gonna move right into the last portion of the presentation, looking at necrotizing endocolitis and the recovery phase, particularly when it comes to reestablishing oral feedings. This presentation was designed and was intended to be presented by Skitsi Tobias. Unfortunately, she was not able to be with us today, but has given us permission to present her portion of the presentation on her behalf. Skitsi does not have anything to disclose concerning actual or potential conflicts related to this presentation and is not presenting any off-label uses of medications. So kind of as already stated, the, we need to look at the impact of necrotizing endocolitis on that baby's future ability to establish feedings. Typically with a baby of neck, we're seeing that baby be made MPO for 10 to 14 days after diagnosis. And having neck in and of itself can have long-term morbidity. But then we also have to look at the associated complications related to being made MPO. Many babies receiving a diagnosis of NAC will have inadequate oral feeding during their recovery time and will continue to require supplementation through parental support or enteral gavage feedings or G-tube supports. With these babies, there's also the increased risk of complications um, to the bowel after NAC, such as a dysmotility syndrome and the formation of strictures, which also prevent a, a challenge with feeding. For the babies, as Dr. Marino said, that do require surgical treatment, especially when a large portion of the bowel is involved, we can see a post-operative development of short bowel syndrome occurring, which can lead to malabsorption, growth delays, and long-term use of TPN, and all the wonderful complications associated with long-term TPN, such as cholestasis. So we really take a look at the oral feeding problems associated with long-term feeding delays and difficulties. And probably top on that list is oral aversion. When you think of the babies and everything that's being introduced in their mouth just in the normal course of prematurity, but also when they become ill, they can develop an oral aversion to all the noxious stimuli that's happened to their mouth. And we can see oral aversion present by gagging, choking, coughing, 
turning away from something that's offered orally. And as that happens, it can set a baby up for being tube feeding dependence if we're not able to reestablish and reintroduce oral feedings, whether that be by um, latching to the breast or by bottle. Even as we pass through the infancy period and move into that toddler phase, we can see toddlers that have a history of feeding difficulties, particularly having difficulties transitioning to textured foods. So during that whole period of time when growth is critical and development is critical, we may be challenged by having that being combined with inadequate nutrition. That can set that child up for developmental delays, not to mention the frustration and anxiety and stress on the family being caused by a child who's having difficulty being fed. So it's really important to provide these parents with interdisciplinary support, not only when inpatient, but also as an out, on an outpatient basis. So the, a way that we can look at intervening on this is having oral feeding strategies. There are evidence, there's evidence-based oral feeding strategies using rehabilitative services that we can employ to prevent long-term feeding difficulties in this patient population. One of our first reach outs is to our speech or occupational therapist, if nothing less on a consult level, but also being integrated into that interdisciplinary team, having frequent contact with the baby and frequent contact with the parents for not only feeding, but also educating the families. And that again is done both on an inpatient and on an outpatient basis. We use strategies such as a cue-based feeding plan, meaning we are letting the baby tell us by their behavior when they are ready to eat. We also have a variety of feeding systems that we can employ. These feeding systems may have specialized nipples, which decrease the flow rate that is coming through the nipple, allowing the baby to better orally manage that feeding and not get quite so overwhelmed when feeding. And we have techniques that we use for things like external pacing, which basically is getting that baby to slow down enough so that they can incorporate sucking, swallowing, and breathing in a coordinated fashion, as well as using certain techniques for positioning, such as a side-lying technique. All of these have shown to improve long-term feeding outcomes in premature infants. It's also really important to consider that because of the complications associated with neck, that infants do not achieve their full oral feeding at the, at the typical milestones. Premature infants who do not have a history of neck would typically achieve full feedings by 36 weeks and four days. But for a premature baby that has a, had a diagnosis of neck, we see that onset of full oral, oral feeding being delayed out to 38 weeks and six days. So you can look at that that's an additional two week hospitalization and all the stressors and potential complications that are involved with an extended hospitalization. So in addition to our oral feeding strategies, we really look at the prevention of neck and some things that we look closely at is starting off with preventing anemia in the baby, which can start at birth by employing delayed cord clamping. We also look at preventing anemia by being very judicious about how often and how much blood we are using for blood sampling, because all of these are associated with increased mortality and long-term morbidity. We can also help reduce the risk by employing good antibiotic stewardship, and that includes in during the maternal course of pregnancy, and limiting medications that we know reduce gastric acidity, such as histamine uh, 2 antagonists. And then also employing the use of standardized feeding guidelines just in general, even before a baby may be presenting as ill, having standardized feedings and standardized feeding advancements. And I think one of the underlying messages that has been put out in today's presentation is not underestimating the value and the importance of use of breast milk. 
mom's breast milk and as a backup donor breast milk to perform oral care and get that baby those immunity properties if nothing else through buccal absorption and then also using that as a gut priming method to introduce immunology into the baby's gut so we cannot stress the importance of using breast milk as one of our key factors that we know decrease the incidence of neck in our um, precious population. And those are Skitsi's references. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley. And again, on behalf of the team, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you guys so much. Um, that was so informative, um, a fantastic talk. I really appreciated that. Um, anyone who um, is listening in, if you guys want to type any questions that you have in the uh, chat box to the right, um, and we can certainly get our speakers to answer some of those. I don't see any questions yet. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask um, one question. I'm not sure who this could be directed to specifically, but um, certainly as a baby friendly hospital, we do a lot of um, emphasis, like you were mentioning on the use of breast milk. But I can imagine, as you also said, having a baby in the ICU is a very stressful time for mom. So are there strategies or techniques or do you ever find it hard for a mom to be able to provide the breast milk for her baby? Or are there things that you guys do to help support that here um, in the hospital? Here at Keniston, we have um, lactation consultants. And then um, also, if I'm not mistaken, all of our nurses are trained to also help. Um, we have breast pumps available in all of our NICU rooms. Um, we have pumping rooms all over our hospital as well. I personally have used them. Um, we also make sure that we have the equipment to go well uh, with it. And in our own lactation department, we have um, supplies available as well. So for instance, I came back to work myself and I found that I was not properly fitted for a flange size and one of the nurses helped me find it and then I was actually able to purchase it right here. So if a mom runs into a problem where she's not the typical mom, where the equipment's not made for her, you know, I was able to get a solution right here and then lactation's always available to answer those questions as well. Oh yeah, we do uh, allow all of our NICU moms to have a free rental of a hospital grade pump to take home, which is really great. And you know, as somebody who also has searched out for pumps herself, it's really, it's very difficult and there's a lot on the market. And you know, it's not always a one size fits all. You kind of need help problem shooting those problems to make the breast milk. Um, and then you've got me, you know, I try to help as much as possible as a part of the team as a dietitian. Um, you know, sometimes I get questions about, um, supplements myself and um, maternal diets of what they can do to help with their breast milk um, and then you know fluids and stuff like that. Um, did I cover it? Do y'all have anything to add? Oh yeah, I'll add in. Hi, this is Robin. Um, I would also add in um, to Sarah's comments that one of the important things that a roles that a nurse can do when a mom is struggling for, for milk is really being her cheerleader and her sounding board. One of the frustrating things for parents is they feel very out of control when they have a baby in the NICU and there's nothing that they can do. And pumping breast milk and supplying that breast milk is one way that we can give control back over to mom and give her the feeling that that is something that she is doing to help her baby. And moms can be very frustrated because milk letdown will happen at different rates for different moms. And just being their cheerleader or even their shoulder to cry in and just being that encouraging force to encourage them to continue to pump and get them the necessary resources like setting them up with lactation, setting them up with nutrition, just to work that through. But being a cheerleader for a mom who's getting very discouraged just overall and then feeling like she's helpless and not doing anything to help her baby, I think is a, is a key component for the nurse at the bedside. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think that that crosses over into the adult world as well, that feeding is something that the families really feel like they have a lot of control over and can help with. So um, that's interesting that those two things cross over into both worlds. Awesome. 
Um, I don't think I see any more questions, still no questions. So um, with that, I will um, thank our speakers again. Thank you all so much for taking the time um, to, to present to us today. This was super informative. Um, we appreciate the, um, the, the discussion. And for those who joined us, thank you all for joining us and um, stay safe and we will see you guys next time.